So we're from Gloucestershire Hospitals Trust, which is just outside of the Midlands, at the tip of the southwest. Um, and we are um, quite a sizable <coughs> acute hospital psychology department which contains different types of practitioner psychologists, so clinical health and counselling. Um, and I'm head of psychology and we're also going to hear from our clinical educator which is the name given to clinical supervisors for CAPS and then our first ever CAP trainee Poppy. Okay, so you may have heard some of this with the paediatric cat role, but one of our reasons for um, trying a different approach to vacancies was noticing that not all our roles need to be um, taken by a practitioner psychologist. Uh, with the assistant psychology roles, we do have um, five at the moment, but obviously the turnover is quite fast, and we wanted some stability for services. So we were also thinking about growing our own and how to keep people locally and demonstrating to the trust really and within the region that we're looking at flexible workforce which obviously there's a big push for at the minute. Um, that in particular means you can train for local needs. Obviously there's a big focus in a lot of mental health trainings to be diverse across adult, older adult children and we know that we have that specific need in physical health. So we looked at institutions and courses um, and we chose an institution that allowed for um, everything is online so there's no travel and we, people don't have to worry about um, fitting that into their day and we were told at the time that the best match of a stream because CAP training is in adult, older adult and child at the moment was to join the older adult stream and add in physical health teaching there, but we'll reflect on, on that um, later in the presentation. We were looking really for that, um, the explanation to us from the university was it's about um, depth rather than breadth. So we wanted to have confidence that, you know, we do work with some complex presentations, that the depth would be there, which is what we were, we were assured of. And within our trust, and probably in most trusts, there's actually a real push for apprenticeships and there's a quota that they have to fill and this is the first psychologist apprenticeship and what that means is that the, the fees, the university fees and everything come out of the apprenticeship part which if you're a budget holder you'll see you probably pay some towards anyway whether you have an apprentice or not it's making best use of the trust finances um, and in terms of that longer term commitment rather than rollover of assistance they were interested in and having a pyramid of expertise rather than being quite top heavy in terms of people delivering clinical skills. So some of the practical assumptions that we made and then we'll review some of the things that maybe didn't work out as well as what did. We presumed it might be better for somebody to train to be across more than one specialty so they have that diversity of experience. So for us, we had our role shared across weight, specialist weight management, tier three is more complex than the weight management, and our pain self-management service. So that's where we had vacancy, so we had pots of money already in our department, so um, as a budget holder can make those decisions. Um, and we thought they'd fit really well together, so there's a mix of quite a focus on group work, but some of the experiences of the patients and how they're treated in society well across pain and, and excessive weight. Um, I was to tell you a bit about selection design and, and outcome that might be helpful and I could send to anyone who's interested what we used. So we had over 100 applicants because our trust failed to cap at the number that I'd asked for. So there's a lot to review. Um, and we tried to make it clear on the information that went out to people that please only apply if you're serious about this route because you can't apply for clinical training until two years after qualifying. So if people are using it as a stepping stone, um, you're trying not to really um, go, go down that route because you'll just lose people as soon as they've done the training. Um, we had a reserve list because quite a few people pulled out last minute. I think those nerves about actually you committing yourself is quite a, a significant amount of time and commitment within one discipline. You can't switch between child, older adult um, and adult once you qualify it's named of which area you work in. So for us, they were adding on psychology. 
Um, and so the reserve list is actually the way in which we got Poppy, who's here, so she's happy for me to share that. So we were really fortunate to be in that position to do a last minute phone call um, and get someone to fill all those spaces. So we interviewed eight on the day. What's really important is that we had two really different panels. So we had one that was academic focused, which had somebody from the university and clinicians. There was a presentation which asked for no um, PowerPoint to be used, because that's not the way that groups work run. But what was crucial is we also had a, a group process, another panel which had experts by experience on, um, which was looking more at value-based. And we found that the scores across the two were actually really different, and it changed who we offered the post to. So I've said about having patient participation, so somebody who'd used our service already was really essential um, and I've got a marking criteria if anybody's interested in that. And, um, and also what we were looking for, because obviously we know there's lots of, for example, assistant psychologists out there who are looking for a stepping stone and might have lots of clinical experience, but we were looking at things like flexibility and tenacity, being patient-centred and being dedicated to this route in particular. Um, another thing that I think will come up when my colleagues speak is we had this impression about a support network within the region for um, CAPS because we've got a lone CAP within our department. So we have a mental health trust literally across the road that has CAPS. Um, but maybe uh, we would suggest getting written agreement of what that setup will look like so that they can do some experiential work in person and also to learn about how CAPS can. Um, work across settings, so for example, eating disorders uh, across the road from us. And thinking about other support networks regionally, we would strongly advise. And there's the potential with um, other pre qualified routes, such as the assistant to trainee clinical psychologist. Um, and then the final point from me was about forward planning for the difference between the band five trainee working in your services and what that's going to look like at band six and differentiating that across your assistants and your newly qualified psychologists. Um, I think that you sort of need that future focus for the department. And to be able to for us, which we'll, we'll come to, so it's worked more smoothly in one clinical and we have been Hello, Kate. Debbie. Hi. Um, I can hear an echo, so I'm hopefully not going to be distracted too much by it. Um, and hopefully, it's just our own that can hear it. But um, my name's Debbie. Um, I'm a health psychologist in the self-management team, so I'm one of our CAPS clinical educators. Um, I was involved in any of the planning the day, so kind of more as, um, when we are CAPS kind of the, on the. Great. Okay, so kind of um, the the summary points from me then as clinical educator supervisor is that our cap copy is fantastic and any outlay of effort um, into her is um, we uh, we managed to get the um, the appointment process as uh, to be a good fit for us, um, which I guess is a testament to the whole process and the panelling. Um, so something I want to say that she's she's um, a real asset and I'm very pleased that she's with us. Um, one thing that worked really well for us is that um, Poppy joined us about a month before her course due to start. So she was able to join the trust, do all the mandatory training, do all the stuff that um, we all have to do in a new role um, before she started kind of navigating her course. So that was a really helpful thing for us to get to know her. Um, and her time um, with us, and certainly the cats, not with you for very long at the start, and then you kind of get more time with, uh, with somebody within their work placement. So that was a really helpful thing that we could get to know her, um, and she could do some of all of that, um, the important stuff, uh, trust training wise. Um, for us, uh, maybe thinking in what Stephanie was saying, is that uh, having a copy within our team. Uh, allows us to have that stratified model of care for psychology. So we were very top heavy before she, she joined. So the opportunity to have more lower level intermediate psychology work is a a 
as she's with us, and um, that's a real testament for us. Um, and as the course is kind of unfolding, so it's new for our camp and it's new for us too, we're starting to get more of a handle of where we need to go, what we need to do to kind of get information. So that, that's just kind of the natural process of any any relationship. So whether we continue to do this in the future, we might have kind of done that learning already, but that's been quite important, I think. And we haven't been able to do that any sooner than it's kind of naturally happened. Um, so, so that's kind of a, um, yeah, a, a useful kind of getting to know the university and the structure of the course as well. Carry on anyway. So um, the, the, kind of the, the summary, uh, or certainly my recommendation, um, which, which is on the next slide whenever it, it can appear. Um, so kind of um, having your cap uh, in the, the department before the placement is, is really important. And actually, I think if we could do this again, we'd actually find it much more um, valuable to have her a little bit sooner. So if, if there's a facility to have um, your cap uh, a couple of months before the course starts, I think that's a really good um, idea, um, if that's possible. And again, kind of more planning and um, preparation ahead of time, because there's a lot of support required um, and kind of hands-on um, kind of support. So making sure whoever um, is, or, or there will be multiple team members, but making sure that's built in the uh, kind of work plan and um, for the clinical educators to make sure the CAP's got um, the right amount of support um, and, and kind of opportunities to do that. So it's so really good useful planning ahead of time wherever possible. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of a clash, I think, with um, kind of uh, clinical work and academic kind of structures. We work on slightly different time scales. Um, lots of our kind of uh, NHS time is planned out well in advance. Whereas I think um, within academic settings, there's a little bit more flux for kind of change. So um, sometimes that, that, that could have been quite tricky. So anything ahead of time is really useful. Um, I think our learning as well has been that because we, um, we thought this split placement would work really well, what it means is it's a further splitting of cap time. So when you don't have your cap in the early days for very long, having to split between two departments can be quite quite hard. Um, so have possibly having one department um, placement, I, I think might, might be fuller again, more planning, um, that works, works really well. Um, for us as well, um, Stephanie mentioned about the work streams. So we kind of just assumed that that would happen because we, we kind of agreed it at the start. But I think being a bit more hands-on to make sure that your cap is going to the most appropriate um, available um, lectures and working groups um, because it doesn't, things don't always happen some of the time. So um, um, that's useful. Uh, and, and finally, thinking about having really clear roles for the CAP because um, you, you might have this in, in your departments, but we've got lots of different um, levels. So we've got assistant psychologists, we have psychology students. Um, so being kind of really clear about what those different roles are, um, and um, yeah, that, that helps everybody, um, but, but make, making sure that's clear. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my uh, just summary of kind of the, the on the ground supervision. Um, so kind of handing over to Poppy about her experiences. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm the um, Appenar service, um, and I guess my experience has been also that starting in the department before the course started was really useful, just being able to um, start learning the processes, who the patients were, what clinical work might look like was definitely, definitely really useful. And as Debbie said, um, you're only in for about two days at the beginning in the workplace, so it would have been a lot harder to sort of catch up with all of that had I not started before, so I found that really useful. Um, I've also found it really useful to have the clinical educator working in the team and um, yeah, yeah, support with the clinical work also in the team, both by the psychologist, parts of my clinical work, but also just in just Jeremy. I also found um, having a physical hand like in my university or PowerPoint stop. Can you? 
health sector in my course helpful to sort of support the learning uh, from a physical health setting. Um, so he was able to answer more specific questions and applications of the models to my different services, which I found really useful to help support my learning. Uh, I think at times it's, it's been a bit difficult to get sort of clear information from the university um, regarding what might be suitable assessment options for my placement and just understanding you know, who to go to do the best process for seeking help. Um, um, oh, bro, thank you. So yeah, that's one of the difficulties we've had. Um, with teaching, I found it um, really interactive and really engaged. There was a little bit of didactic and theoretical information, but often it's filled with a lot of breakout rooms and opportunities to practice the taught skills. So there's lots of discussions that I found it really engaging and really useful teaching. Um, and then lastly, the, the overarching theme of the course, I've often described as feeling like you're spinning a lot of plates. There's a lot of different aspects to the course that you have to keep on top of. And you've got the study days, the assignments, the workplace days and clinical work and other aspects of the course where you have to sign off different competencies. So that's sort of like the general overarching feeling. Um, so yeah, uh, next slide please, if possible. Ah, oh, lovely, thank you. Um, so yeah, my recommendations would be um, to use some of the workplace time or time on placement to support some of the teaching with physical health examples. Um, so being able to take some time to think about the models of the teaching and what that looks like specifically for the service I'm in and how it might be used for patients. The university does provide a few days for these, well for my course they did, but it was kind of at the beginning and it was used for other training, so maybe just blocking out more work based on for that would be really useful. Um, I think I find peer support quite useful with other cats in physical health specifically, just as another opportunity to practice some of the taught skills, do some role plays or test out or discuss the models and how we might apply them. Uh, the next one is, yeah, again, like Debbie said, being in that one team, I think it's been really useful. We've sort of figured it out as we've gone along, but the, because the time is so split between the university and the service, it feels really nice to get grounded and develop the skills in one service, and then once qualified, move, maybe move and, and then be able to apply the skills I've learned. Uh, and lastly, it might sound really obvious, but um, sort of organising and planning your time really well. So for study days, I used to plan out what I would have to do each day so that I could meet the assessment deadlines. And um, another thing that I think is quite important to prioritise is annual leave, feeling like um, being able to book that in and then work the workplace time and the university assignments around that just as a priority. Because I've personally found that trying to slot it in a little bit later or with not so much notice has actually been a bit harder. So I guess that would be my yeah my set of recommendations. Oh yes, Debbie. I was just going to chip chip in there about the um, annual annual leave and, and actually a kind of feedback possibly to our university would be that there is no break. You know, there's no break. To there so it would be really nice that that's built in. You know, sometimes there's kind of um, reading weeks and things like that within the academic structure, but it doesn't translate to the cat play um, would be really nice to eat that also kind of that, that might be different in other, in other kind of places um, but that I think that would be really important to kind of acknowledge thank you that's the end of our presentation so it's just whether anyone had any questions and whether we can hear you or not this is another matter thank you around values-based recruitment and how you as a team work through the waiting to ensure that the service uh, user position 
actually was able to be foregrounded? Yeah, well, yeah, given priority. Given a, a more priority yeah. over the more competency based traditional recruitment. Yeah, so the, uh, the two panels were weighted equally, so one that was the service user-led and one that was um, academic and clinician-led. We did also have clinicians in on the service user panel for support. There were supposed to be two um, former patients that ended up just being one was well enough on the day. And we also had, it sounds a bit awful, but we had the power to veto which is what I've done with um, service user involvement before, so there could be kind of red flag where that could be discussed where there were any concerns, um, and that did actually get used, okay. um, which was very helpful when looking at scoring. We also, when we drew up the scores and we listed them, um, you could kind of see the order in which people were rated and how it differed, differed on the two panels. We added in any of the red flags, um, and it just, it, um, when we made our final decision, it was directed by the service user panel. Brilliant, thank you, that was really helpful. Did that answer, Marie, you have that perfect. Thank you. thank you. Any more questions from the room? Okay, so John? With the recruitment, we had a discussion earlier about um, where possible to try and to privilege uh, local groups into these sorts of roles in order to retention of staff. So I'm wondering whether that was part of their recruitment as well, whether they thought about that in their selection process. Lovely. Did you um, so carry on? Sorry. Yeah, I think so. So we didn't. We didn't officially do that, um, but part of the reason I think that I'm finding with assistant psychology interviews at the minute as well is making them in person. I think when they're done online, maybe people further away, then maybe won't be as committed or, or end up not coming down, can take place. So we do try to make them in person. But then that concerns me about, you know, are we are we ruling some people out? So it's really tricky. And uh, I, I would like some, uh, some sort of HR guidance on what we're allowed to say. So we were told that we couldn't, we couldn't put that in because it's discriminatory. But I wonder if there could be something, some direction from our ICB of, of how we could legally have roots to grow our own. Uh, what could be people now? Yeah, so we, so we weren't allowed to. Um, we were, were aware of where people were from after we shortlisted. So when I was phoning Poppy up thinking, oh, this is quite good, she's next on the list and she's in Bristol, but she was actually in Scotland I think, when I phoned and had to come down from holiday to do the interviews. Um, but I think we did have a high dropout because, and I'd just be really aware of that, that people realise that it's actually a really big commitment. You've got 18 months training and then you're committed to that role for two years. Um, and so I think some people got cold feet. Mm. And what I tried to do to prepare for that is write in the invitation, please only accept this if you really want to come, and also please withdraw so that we can fill the places. What I have on an ongoing basis with assistant posts is people drop, they just don't respond, and then you can't put your your next on the list down because they never withdraw, and they've got up until two, a day or two before the interview. So our recruitment wouldn't um, sort that for me. They said it's too late now. It, was, it must have been maybe the day or two days before, so I had to do the phoning round of mm -hmm. filling places, but it was worth it because this was so vital to get right. Brilliant. I think that's, that's really helpful. And I think, John, um, I think one of the things that I, I'd say when we uh, recruited um, caps in, in, in sort of Birmingham and, and Solimar, that notion about uh, commitment from lo uh, you know, a local population and the realities that this is a, an expectation that post qualification that you will be working in this role you know, for, for two years and all the development that comes with that um, was reiterated at every step of the recruitment. Um, and certainly from my point of view, what we also did is we started <coughs> off with an expressions of interest first. To, to, to almost like um, start to really hone down people that were were committed to want to take this through. It's the, it's the dilemma, isn't there? It's a useful thing too about the or contradiction in terms of that desire for a local a workforce that's concerned with local population, potentially come from a local population, and, and that thing about um, not discriminating against people from yeah. outside and further afield. So yeah. it's how we manage that tension. Yeah. That's a really good, really good call. Any more? Uh, I may have misheard something, but I think she said that she would elaborate on 
challenges associated with the course being on the road of focus. Yeah, okay, thank you. We've got a question around uh, any um, challenges that are associated with the course being older adult, primarily older adult focus, and whether you can elaborate on how you work through that. Um, yeah, so I've been put, I was put into the old adult stream and um, when the timetable came out and the teaching sessions were released, one of them was a little bit, um, not a little bit, it was focused on a model for dementia, so I just sort of questioned it with Debbie, my clinical educator, and then that has when we realised that we needed to change some of the streams and they were really um, approachable and that was absolutely beautiful and I could just switch to being the one most relevant to my workplaces. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Debbie. I think if we'd have been able in advance to see the adult stream and the older adult stream and create a bespoke programme, that would have been really helpful. And what happened is right up until, in fact, I think after Poppy started, they were still designing the teaching. So we didn't get that opportunity, whereas I think in the future we would probably recommend, and the University of Nam mentioned, go on to adult stream and then probably the other way around, pick some bits from the older <laughs> adult but stay within that adult stream as the main one rather than the older adult. That's really that's really helpful and helpful feedback as well for the university. Is that okay? James. Can I just check, is that the Exeter Caps course? Debbie, was that the Exeter it's Plymouth. 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 It's a Plymouth course. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, just asking about future proofing and planning ahead for a band six cap role. Did that open up a new new models of working, or was it just adding extra capacity into an existing kind of model? I'm just interested to know how it might evolve and what you offer. Did you hear that? So the que the question was around. I think it's something around. Use, it? Uh, yes, but about capacity use, but also in terms of developing your workforce for the for, for the future. Was there the potential of actually developing um, a post qualification caps role to deliver something more than than has already been delivered? Yeah, so um, we have, um, within our service, we've got very psychologically informed non-psychologists. So I think actually, um, Poppy and certainly the CAP role, it adds to our psychological offer within our team. So I think um, what, what we might distribute is some of the work that our psychology-informed non-psychologists would do versus some of the more lower-level work that our qualified psychologists do that maybe don't need a qualified psychologist to do. So actually you can pull those to create a really appropriate piece of work um, for a CAP role that previously didn't exist. Um, we don't um, currently take trainees, so possibly that would be filled within that element. Um, so uh, yeah, so I think we, we're just um, we're using our psychological capacity more helpfully and also being able to use our other disciplines and our skills Thanks. I think that, that was helpful. Did that answer? Yes, I've got some nods there. Any more questions? I'm going to use the opportunity because um, just so you, you know, we made a decision that we're not going to run a virtual plenary with more <laughs> connectivity challenges. So I'll ask your questions now. Ali. I just wanted to ask, I think Stephanie said at the beginning she'd be willing to share some of her interview materials. How do we go about getting our hands on them? I think, um, I, well, I think what we can do is, um, um, Steph and Debbie, it was about the question of your um, very kind and generous view of sharing some of your materials. If you could send that through to the PPN, we can then forward it on. Fab. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Is that much. okay? Yeah, no problem. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you.